Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. Before I talk about today's guest, I just wanted to share something really fast, kind of a personal update. I didn't post uh, an episode last week because I've been focusing on three things. The first one is raising money for my company. It's taken a lot of energy and hopefully we will have a result soon and when we do, I'll be happy to announce it. The second thing is I've been working on my visa application for Portugal and actually as of the posting of this episode, I have officially submitted my visa application to the Portuguese government where uh, once they approve it, I'll be able to finally leave America after what's now been eight and a half, nine months here and then I will move to Portugal and become a resident of Portugal. So it's a special visa, a special program, and I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully I will get a result in March um, in about 15 to 20 days, and I'll let you guys know when I know for sure. The third thing I've been working on is moving my grandmother to an assisted living facility. Mentally, she's fine. Physically, she needs a walker. She's just bored being at home by herself, and she wants to be around other people. So I've embarked on uh, moving her there. Unfortunately, a lot of my family hasn't been willing to help me at all. So I've been uh, doing a lot of her work, which has kind of gotten into the, the way of Portugal and my company a little bit, as well as my health. But suffice it to say, things are coming to a head. Portugal's coming soon. My grandma is moving in the next two weeks and my company is raising funds. So everything is looking up and 2022 is going to be fantastic. So our guest today is Paige Arnoff Fenn, and she is the founder and CEO of Mavens and Moguls. She's been running this company for 20 years. They provide marketing, branding, PR, market research, and communications. They're based in Massachusetts. She's a fantastic human being, and what she went through is probably something that I can never imagine. I can definitely sympathize with, but it's difficult to empathize because of uh, the difficulty of what she's endured. She'll tell you more about what happened, but essentially the topic of today is how to deal with or or what she learned from death and illness in her family and how it improved her business. And I also shared uh, some stories as well from things that I experienced uh, with death and illness in my family. And so I think it's really important for all of you to listen to this entire episode and try to understand the pain and suffering we've endured because even if you haven't, you almost certainly will one day. And it's not that I want you to experience that, but hopefully what we talk about will help make it easier for you to endure and to to go through when the time comes. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you for sticking with me. We are getting close to episode 100. Thanks, everyone. Welcome to We Live to Build. My name is Sean Weisbrot, and I'm an entrepreneur, investor, and advisor based in Asia for over 12 years. Join us every week to fast track your personal growth so you can meet the ever increasing demands of the company or companies you are passionately building. Time waits for no one, so let's get started now. Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. I'm here today with Paige, and we're going to be talking about what it was like dealing with the death of a loved one. I believe in your story, there's multiple deaths in a short period of time, unfortunately, and the importance of what you learned through that journey and what people can learn if they have to go through that as well. So thank you for sharing this story with us, Paige. Welcome, and why don't you tell everyone about yourself? Thanks, Sean. I appreciate you inviting me here. So yeah, it was a very sad chapter in uh, my entrepreneurial journey. So I started a uh, marketing company about 20 years ago called Mavens and Moguls. And for the first five years, like a lot of entrepreneurs, I was just working all the time, every day, scared to take any time off at all. You know, you hear the statistics, you read about all the startups that fail in the first few years. 
And I wanted to be a success story. So I was just working, working, working. After having been an employee for decades, when it's your business, there's always more you can be doing. And you just, you know, you think, oh, I'll do one more proposal or let me just update my website. And so you're smiling. You you know what I'm talking about. So for about five years, I just literally worked nonstop. And about five years into the business, a really good friend of mine was getting married at a kind of destination wedding. And I really wanted to take time off to go be part of her celebration. So I took my first vacation and I was worried that like the whole company would unravel if I took a week off. But you know what? It did fine. The company survived. I came back and I got back to work. And then I started taking maybe a weekend off or a long weekend. I didn't take any big vacations. Almost a decade into the business, it wasn't even a decade, it was maybe like six or seven years. My husband and I were in this situation where my parents, his parents, my stepfather, my great aunt, one of his siblings, all of a sudden, People started to get sick and decline, and it was a really tough period because, you know, he and I had been very fortunate until that point, you know, maybe when we were young, we had grandparents die, but we had gone through a a really good stretch of decades with people being vibrant and healthy and kind of living a great life. And this was coinciding basically with the Great Recession, if you remember that 2008, 9, 10 period. That's when it started. Watching these loved ones starting to get sick was really hard. And my husband and I live on the East Coast. My mom lived in the Deep South with her husband. My father and his parents lived on the West Coast, 3,000 miles away. His sister was on the West Coast. So as these people started to decline, we were thousands of miles away. The good news is they all had excellent care. My husband and I, we had both started our companies, so we had flexibility. We could get on airplanes and go spend time with them. But when you're an entrepreneur and when you're kind of type A neurotic, you like fixing problems and you feel very energized by kind of charging the mountain and fixing the problem and attacking the next mountain and solving the next problem. But it was pretty obvious that most of these problems were things that we couldn't fix. You know, it was advanced stage cancer and, you know, heart disease and depression. Like these were really big problems that were not likely to get solved. Um, My husband and I both have siblings, but we were the only ones without children and we were the only ones that worked for ourselves. So we had the most flexibility of anybody and we also had the best relationship with our families. So it was easiest for us to get on a plane and go help and work from anywhere because that even before COVID and hybrid and virtual, we were very comfortable with our cell phones and our laptops just working from wherever we we were. In a six-year window, we lost seven people who were very, very dear to us. So if you remember as a kid, that game of whack-a-mole where they keep popping up and you keep hitting and they keep popping up, that's kind of what it felt like. It was a really tough period where we were able, luckily, to spend a lot of time and to help them um, in ways that we couldn't have maybe if we were employees or if we had had our own families that we were trying to juggle. And then because my husband and I are also the most business minded of all the siblings, we became the executor and executrix of a lot of those estates. And that's like having another full time job. You know, he and I didn't go to law school. That was not something we were trained to do. But we learned and we kept relearning and learning better as more and more people left us that responsibility. So it was a very challenging time. And I learned so much about priorities and time management, gratitude. It was it was tough. But having gotten through it, thank goodness and feeling really proud and at peace that we were able to be there for the family members. You really do have closure when you get to say everything you ever wanted to say to a loved one. There's nothing left unsaid. It made me feel a lot of empathy and compassion for people who lose loved ones in an accident or an immediate heart attack or something where it was a surprise and you never got to say goodbye or maybe you left on bad terms. You had just had a fight or something. It was not like that at all. I mean, we had the warning shot was fired. And in many cases, we had years of decline, which was hard for the 
person in decline, but it gives you a runway to say and do everything you have ever wanted to. So for that, I'm eternally grateful. My father and mother both lost their parents as teenagers. Their parents were both very, very young. And I mentioned this in the in an episode that came out earlier. My mother's mom was 32 and oh. my dad's dad was 42. And they were very sudden for both of them. Absolutely. No question. My mom died in her 60s. My dad died in his 70s. My great aunt died in her 90s. My stepfather died in his 80s. They were all premature, believe it or not. Even my great aunt, who was 97, I think, her parents didn't die until 98 or 99. She thought she still had at least a few more birthdays in her. And she was one of the most active people, kind of like Betty White just dying at almost 100. That was kind of my great aunt. She had friends in every generation and she was very active socially. So I felt like I lost all of them too young, but I am absolutely certain. I'm so sorry for your parents. No question that affected who they are and who they became. No question. So not only that, but then my mom had to deal with my grandfather dying over like, he he died slowly over like an eight year period. Yep. And the last like four or five years, he was in bed and couldn't really stand. Getting up and laying down was really all he could do. It was a mess. And I was here for parts of it. From what I could see, it was horrible. No, nah, it's it's horrible. It really is. But I will tell you, you know, earlier, if you had met me in my 20s or my 30s, I was such a hard charging type A. I wanted to conquer the world and be CEO and make a ton of money and be on the cover of all the magazines as like a superstar CEO. And I think when you see someone, my dad and my stepdad were both CEOs of big companies. They were both very successful in their career. Careers. But you realize like nobody on their deathbed wishes that they made more money or wishes that they had more promotions or that they won more awards or that they were on more magazine covers. That's not important at all. And, you know, they want to be with the people they love. They want them to know how much they meant to them. It really left a very strong impression on me. Like when it's all said and done, like who's going to remember you? What are they going to remember you for? How did you touch people's lives? I feel like it was such a privilege for my husband and me to be in a position where we could drop everything and get on a plane and spend a lot of quality time with them in these very intimate situations where you can talk about situations in their life that maybe were really happy or really sad or any regrets that they had. You know, my mom, she spent her whole life, you know, being very fit and active and eating super healthy. She didn't drink. She didn't smoke. She didn't eat butter. She would have a bite of dessert and that was it. Like she was so so healthy. And then she got a very terrible form of cancer that was very advanced. And the doctors told her she had four to six months. She lasted for another two and a half years, which was amazing. But she died. And on her deathbed, one of the last conversations I had with her, I said, you know, if you could do it again, is there anything like glaring that you would do differently? And without even any hesitation, she said, you need to drink the wine and eat the butter and have dessert. Like, <laughs> she's <laughs> don't skip. So I do. <laughs> yeah, that kind of sounds like how I've gone with the way that I live is that I, I restrict a lot of these things, but I feel like I've had my fun. You should have fun every day. Don't postpone fun. Do something fun every day. I mean, I, I definitely do. For me, fun is more important than work. <laughs> but what I mean is like, I don't go for alcohol. I don't go for cigarettes. Like, I, I don't do those things that I believe are going to hurt me because I want to minimize the damage I do to my body. But I've heard of other people, like I, my dad had a friend who was an infectious disease doctor. And this guy could run 30 flights up the stairs without, you know, getting tired like crazy strong athlete he got lung cancer and died in his 50s right super healthy no guarantees so it seems like the people who do everything they can to mess up their bodies and their lives live forever and the people who try to be healthy and good die young well, it, there are examples at both extremes, I would say. I heard of this guy who was like 105 and they're like, how do you do it? He's like, well, I have my cigarette and I've got my glass of wine every day and that's what I do. Like he doesn't go for walks. He doesn't do anything. The guy's thin. I mean, luck and genes play a 
a big part of everything. I mean, I think, you know, don't make any unforced errors. I wouldn't be riding around on a motorcycle drunk with no helmet. That's kind of dumb. What was the hardest thing about going through all of this with them that people might have to think about or go through? So my husband and I are seven years apart and our parents are like a decade or more apart. And yet we went through this during the exact same six year window. It happened really early for my parents and kind of actuarially about when it was supposed to for his. His parents died in their mid 80s, which I think is about a normal life today. So what was really amazing, my husband and I had been married for more than a decade, and I thought we had a great marriage. But I think when you're tested in that way, you really see what people are made of. And you really, you know, you can talk a good game. You know, what did Mike Tyson used to say? Everybody has a plan until you get punched in the nose. Everyone can say they're close with their family and they value family and here are my priorities. But then when it's life or death and things are on the line, how do they act? I was very fortunate that my husband and I both rose to the occasion. And there were periods where we were kind of ships in the night. He would get on a plane and go, to see his family and I'd be getting on a plane to see my family. Like we we had to kind of tag team because once the decline started, his dad died, then a year later my my mom died, then two years later my stepfather died, then his mother died, then my father died. To have somebody to go through it with that you trust, that has your back, that you can vent to, that can pump you up when you need support, that can give you a shoulder to cry on when you need that, and that can be helpful and up beat when you get little good news or periods where the person's turning a corner and doing a little better maybe you really know if you have a rock solid relationship if you've gone through something like that it's not a given you know i've seen a lot of friends and family dissolve during these stressful periods the other thing is when people really are needing help there's usually one sibling who really bears the load and there are a lot of siblings doesn't matter how many there are who talk a good game but don't really show up to help. They always have an excuse. And like I said, my husband and I don't have children. When people have school age kids, it's hard to drop everything. And, you know, they have vacation plans and they have exams and they have recitals and tournaments. And I get it. But for us, we just put everything on, on the back burner and jumped on an airplane and went. An important lesson for me, so, I, you know, the first, call it six, seven years of my company, I was a networking machine. I would show up at breakfast meetings, lunch meetings, coffee meetings, cocktail parties, evening events, lectures. I was out and about two, three times a day, shaking hands, giving speeches, swapping business cards, and I was running into a lot of people constantly, running into some of the same people sometimes twice a day or three times a week. And during that period, like I said, I had to get on a plane and be thousands of miles away for a week at a time, 10 days at a time. And then you're gearing up for a trip and then you come back and you have to get caught up from the trip. So instead of being everywhere all the time, during that window, I was maybe going instead of one, two, three networking events a day, I might only go to five networking events a month. And I had to be very selective and strategic about the events that I was going to go to. It would have to work with the calendar of when I was going to be in town, but I'd want to go to the highest impact activities. And when I'd go, I'd run into people who I used to run into all the time and they'd say, oh my God, Paige, I haven't seen you in forever. Where have you been? I feel like I'm not going to the right events anymore because I used to see you. Where are you going that I'm not going? So it's funny, like people, they don't ask me how I'm doing, Where you know, are you okay? They they, it's all about them. Like, where should I be networking? Where are you networking? Why am I not networking where you're networking? And it has nothing to do with them. My mother's dying of cancer, you know, thousands of miles away. I haven't been here. That's why you haven't seen me. But they don't even think about it that way. But what's really interesting, you know, I used to be that consultant that would, you know, have a meeting, write a proposal, send them the proposal over email, and then the next day, start emailing and calling. Hi, did you get the proposal? What did you think? 
Do you have any questions? Let's set up a meeting. And the client's like, I got the proposal yesterday. Give me a time. Let me read it. Call me next week. Let's put this aside for a minute. Back off. But I'm like very excited because I thought, oh, this is a great new project. Well, when this was happening, I didn't have time to kind of be pleasantly persistent or maybe stalking a little bit. You know, I would send a proposal, then I'd get on an airplane that day, and then I'd be back a week later. And then it would take me a day or two to get caught up. So it's now been 10 days since I sent the proposal. So I reach out to the client and I'm like, oh, Jim, I am so sorry. I sent you a proposal 10 days ago. I've been so busy. I have not even checked in. Do you have any questions? Can you know, does it make sense to set up a call? And in that 10 day period, Jim probably talked to a lot of consultants. They all sent him proposals and they've all been stalking him for 10 days. And I've been radio silent. So Jim calls me back and he said, Paige, it's so good to hear from you. You know, you must be the only working marketing person in town because these people are on my phone, in my email. They call, they hang up. They don't think I have caller ID. They're making me crazy. You clearly are busy. You clearly have a business. I'm going to go with you because you're so respectful. You're not stalking me. I loved your proposal. Let's wait a week. Call me in two weeks if you haven't heard from me. I want to get going, but we'll do it. We'll start next month. And that was it. And I'd send him an invoice. And that didn't happen once. It didn't happen twice. It was happening all the time. So my hit rate was going up, not down. It was not hurting my business. It was helping my business. And that was a real lesson to me, like flashing light, like Paige, relax, back off. Less is more. You do not need to stalk people. You need to be busy. You need to control your calendar. And so as the people started to die and we started to take on the estate administration, administration, which you have a lot more control over your calendar. You don't have to be running around crazy like when people are in a hospital. I really made made a note to myself, like instead of replacing all that time and energy that I used to do with networking, which I had replaced with, you know, visiting family members at hospitals and traveling, I want to add back to my calendar more white space. Like I need to exercise. I need to read. I need thinking time. I need strategy time. I don't need to go to these big networking events two, three times a day. I can go a few times a month, check in with the right people in the right venue at the right time that works for my calendar. And I can have a more productive and sustainable, profitable business. And sure enough, if that's not the case, I think my business today is so much stronger and healthier than it was in that first decade because I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And now I have a much more strategic approach. I'm being much more thoughtful. I have time on my calendar for working out, for doing smaller networking events, kind of less is more where it's quality over quantity. I might go have coffee or lunch with one or two people, not go to a hotel ballroom with hundreds of people, which is not happening right now anyway with COVID. But I think we've learned a lot about virtual networking and coffee meetings and virtual cocktails with people that you want to stay connected to. But, you know, not having to like jump on the subway or drive 30 minutes to meet for somebody for a sandwich. You could do a virtual lunch on Zoom. And you know what? You can get a lot done that way. We've all figured it out over the last 22 months. I feel like I'm building a more uh, sustainable business for the long term. And the clients that I've got now, I've got deeper relationships with. I'm doing more work with fewer people. So it's a more profitable business model than it was when I started. So 20 years into it, I feel like I have a a stronger, healthier, better business, more profitable business than I did when I was running around crazy in that first, you know, those first few years where I wasn't taking vacation. (laughs) You definitely fit into this this stereotype I've heard of where you need to run a business for 10 years before you start to understand how the business works. 
I've never heard that, but that's true in my case. The other thing is that suffering leads to growth. I am living proof. I have all the war wounds and scars to prove that. It's sad, but interesting that such a tragedy taught you how to do your business better. I could not have learned these lessons any other way. I want to go off kind of into a tangent. You were talking about knowing who you can really trust when tragedy strikes. And you also were talking about how your family members ran large companies. So I imagine, maybe I'm wrong if I am, correct me. I imagine that they had an estate to leave that was worth having someone they could trust to manage the execution of it. Did you find that there were people who expected something but didn't get something and then made your life hell because of it, (laughs) even though it had nothing to do with you, especially and probably most likely the people who weren't really there towards the end? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody who's been through this process probably has stories that would make your hair curl. You really do um, see people's true motivations motivations and you understand what people's values are in a time like that. There there are people that feel entitled. There are people that feel we could do a whole nother show on that. It's not, it's, it's kind of, you know, I always tell people, I'm sure, you know, I don't have children, but I'm sure for women that have gone through childbirth, like at the end, you get this hopefully beautiful, healthy baby, and you're so happy. But you forget when they're wheeling you into the, you know, room to deliver the kid, you're going to go through a lot of pain to get through to the thing that you want, which is a healthy baby. Um, Like, oh, God, I forgot about this part. This sucks. (laughs) That's what I've heard from my sister and my girlfriends, at least. At the end of the day, Everybody wants to have a tidy estate and everyone thinks they've done a great job estate planning. And I can tell you, one died with no will and one died with a will that had 16 different amendments, one for each year that they updated their will in the last, you know, decade and a half of their life. So we saw the entire spectrum of people that like died with nothing to give anybody and thought they didn't even need a piece of paper to people who thought, you know, I'm going to be really responsible and Make sure every T is crossed and every I is dotted and everything in between. At the end of the day, whether you have an estate worth nothing or an estate that's substantial, it all comes down to a few pieces of paper that tells who's going to get what. I think people should give a lot of thought into kind of their values and what they want to leave people, not necessarily material things or financial things. Tell the stories and share the the reason if you have like an expensive car or an expensive vase or an expensive house that you're leaving somebody, if you don't have the story behind why that was important to you, why did you save that jewelry? Why did you save that money clip or those cufflinks? Why did you want someone to get those ties or those shoes um, or that bicycle? Take the time to share the stories and tell about your family and what they valued and how they got here and the ups and the downs and the goods and the bads, because that's what sticks with people. If they're going to get a check at the end of the estate administration, they are going to be people that just blow the check. It's really sad. This person, you know, worked really hard and then they left their deadbeat kids some money and the kid's an idiot and the money's gone. And so what? I mean, what was that all about? It would have been much better to leave it to a charity or some group that could do something good for the world. But people have to make their own decisions and people have their own priorities. So I guess I would just encourage people to, whether they have a little bit or a lot, think about both the financial and material things, but also think about the people and the stories and the values that you want to pass on to the next generation. I had uh, a lot to do with my great uncle's passing in terms of my father was the executor and he had a good bit of cash set aside and he was a hoarder. And I mean, you've probably never seen such a disgusting place in your life. 
I spent probably two weeks cleaning the house, top to bottom, opening garbage bags. The, the, the garage was about six or seven feet high with just garbage bags with things inside of them that he saved. Not tra not like garbage, but like things that he thought were important to save. You know, there was things all over the place and we didn't know what anything was. And he, he had a will, but it wasn't like a binder. Here's my will. Here's, you know the credit card like he didn't have his death prepared really so you have to like go through all the bags well is the the card for this bank account here is key you know what's this key for you know like you have to just go through everything i don't know what your experience was but it was absolute hell and nobody else wanted to do anything to help and yet they were expecting my father to quickly give them what they were told they were gonna get yeah i get it i understand that taught me a lot. I, I created my first will about a few years ago just because I I didn't want there to be any sort of question for anyone in case I were to die early. But it's not something I like to think about. I don't think anybody likes to think about it, but... That's a responsible thing to do. That's good you did it. I think my parents got lucky that I'm the kind of person that hates things. So nothing makes me happier than throwing things away. Right. <laughs> That's a, that's a very good quality when it comes to cleaning up estates and not being a greedy person because every family has people that are very greedy, I'm afraid. I wasn't given anything from the estate, but my parents got a third. So I was like, enjoy. I did it because I wanted to help them get the money as fast as possible. Sure. You know, it wasn't a small amount of money. It's like, who doesn't want that as fast as possible? And nobody else was going to help. So interestingly enough, I was here a few years ago when uh, my dad happened to be going through heart problems and we weren't sure if he was going to make it or not. I, I stayed 10 months and I took care of him. So I understand the caretaker role. I was there full time for 10 months taking care of him, cooking, cleaning, driving him to rehab. When we were in the hospital, he was there for like a week or two. He was there the first time for like three days, the second time for like five or six days. Um, he ended up having, needing open heart surgery. They replaced his aorta. And like nobody around me understood anything about what was going on. So I had to learn how to read like what's what's SO2, you know, what's saturated oxygen? What's what is a normal blood pressure? What's normal heart rate? What, where is it abnormal? What pills does he need to be taking? Making sure the nurses actually feed him and, and take his measurements and give him his medications. And I was catching them all making mistakes. And like I insisted on getting him moved to another hospital with another doctor and like I alone made all of that happen because everyone else was just like they were all stuck. You have to have a patient advocate. My husband and I learned that with our parents and with our own situations that were not life or death. But you absolutely have to have somebody listening, watching, reading, connecting the dots because all the nurses, oh my God, they're so overtaxed and exhausted and burned out. But you're absolutely right. Like you have to do that. It's not negotiable. I think I was 31 then. Ever since then, I've kind of just felt like money doesn't matter, work doesn't matter, everything else can go to hell. All that matters is you make sure that you're, you're health. No, your health is your wealth. There is no question about that. Is there anything else that you want to share from your experience? Try and find the things every day to be happy and grateful for. And if people mean something to you that for your loved ones, let them know how important they are. Don't leave anything unsaid. People squabble and have disagreements, but if it's someone you genuinely care about and you want in your life, make it a priority because life is short and jobs come and go and money comes and goes, but time only goes one direction and nobody gets out of this alive, you know? So make sure you don't waste your time and make sure you keep the people that you love and trust and want to be part of your world, hold them tight and keep them with you. And if people are sucking you dry or wasting your time and energy, you need to move on. You know, think about the people that have checked in on you and that you've checked in on that have been part of your bubble that have helped you find a vaccine that have helped you get food when you needed it or whatever. Some of them are family and some of them are friends that are maybe more your family than your actual blood relatives now. I think a lot of people have realized, you know, family is what you make it to be. It's like you can be born into a family, but there are a lot of families that have basically been made 
by choice through this pandemic, the people that have really looked out for each other and had each other's backs and really cared and were there for each other when they needed it, who would come do a social distance visit and help you find toilet paper or anything that, you know, was out of stock. And I just feel like you want to bring your humanity and compassion to every situation going forward and not let the things that don't matter knock you off your game. Like, Keep the big picture in mind. Keep the big priorities in mind. And if everything else is just a distraction, let it go. Don't worry about the, the little gnats and irritations that, you know, if they're like flies, just swat them away and focus on the people and the things that really matter. Um, we've all been through a lot this last 22 months. And hopefully you've learned who and what is the most important and that you will remember that in a post-pandemic world, you know, stick to the things that really matter and just let the rest of it go. Very wise words. Thank you. So how can people follow up with you? So the best way to find me is either on the Mavens and Moguls website, www.mavensandmoguls.com, M-A-V-E-N-S, a-N-D-M-O-G-U-L-S dot com or look me up on LinkedIn, Paige Arnoff hyphen Fenn, A-R-N-O-F hyphen F-E-N-N, Paige with an I. Those are, you can, all, you know, with a name like mine, if you Google me, you'll find me. If you like this episode or you like what Paige had to say, if you're interested in her services, definitely reach out to her. And don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of your health every day. Thank you very much for your time, Paige. 